مولاي صل وسلم دائما ابدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم مولاي صل وسلم دائما ابدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم يا اكرم الخلق ما لمن الوذ به سواك عند حلول الحادث عمم ولي ضيق رسول الله جاهك بإذا الكريم تحلى باسم متقم مولاي صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم فإن من جودك الدنيا وضارتها ومن علومك علم اللوح والقلم يا نفس لا تقنط من زلة عظمة إلى الكبائر في الغفران كلما بمولا يصل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم we've um, made mention of is that there are two sort of primary themes with regards to Mecca. The first is Iman and the second is Akhlaq. The second is um, relates to the character that the Prophet Sallallahu came to complete. We said that was um, that's espoused inside of the tradition of Sayyid Abu Dhar al-Khifari. With Sayyid Abu Dhar al-Khifari, he sends his brother who's called Inais al-Khifari in order to see the Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca. And upon returning, after seeing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Iqad, where he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions to Abu Dhar that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is somebody who calls unto monotheism and what's called makarim al-akhlaq, the high virtues of character. And so these are the themes of Mecca. The themes of Mecca are clearly the theme of faith, no doubt whatsoever, especially yani, what we would, could consider in the radical re-manifestation of prophetic in monotheism. And then the second is what is the akhlaq, which is going to be important because obviously as Mecca progresses, the period of time in Mecca progresses, we're going to see the manifestation of enmity towards the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody who initially was extremely loved and respected by the Quraysh, okay, that the Prophet ﷺ was someone that the Quraysh, even at the beginning of prophecy, that many of them were careful to know that at the beginning of prophecy, they never directly saw the Prophet ﷺ as a threat, even when he was speaking one. The issue of Tawheed, they never saw him as a threat. There was too much sort of love for the Messenger of Allah in terms of how he carried himself and what they knew of him inside of Mecca society. But once the Prophet begins to speak yani, on the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the gods of Quraysh and begins to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as understood in the great sort of monotheistic continuum, then the Quraysh at that point see the threat that the Prophet ultimately comes with the new order. Okay? Some of the ulama are careful to note that if we look at some of, a lot of the formative verses inside of the Quran, that even with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how, how do we face a society of disbelief or a society of, um, of polytheistic belief, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the formative verses inside of the Quran revealed that always refers to himself as Rabb, the Lord. That you will not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to him himself as any other type of name that could be considered controversial inside of Qurayshi society. As an example, Rahman. As soon as the Prophet starts speaking Rahman, and he tends, it sends the Quraysh yani, all sort of yani, irrational, because you have no frame of reference for Rahman, Rahman. We see that later, even later in the, in the Hudaybiyah, which we'll look at, where the Prophet Sallallahu sits with Suhail bin Amr, Suhail bin Amr, who was somebody who had no doubt whatsoever an ethical standard and he wasn't one of the people who had sort of enmity for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi nor was Suhail bin Amr one of those who um, considered what's called a mustahzi, those who would ridicule the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And the proof of that is that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi goes to Ta'if, which is sort of part of what we're going to, inshallah ta'ala, engage, when the Prophet goes to Ta'if Sallallahu Alaihi and returns from Ta'if in order to re-enter Mecca, Suhail bin Amr is one of the people he approaches for protection which is a sign, this is the end of Mecca, a sign that Suhail is not of those, those Meccans who will have any, they do not have a grudge with the Messenger, they're not trying to belittle him 
nor are they trying to belittle the religion of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi But obviously, he remains he remains a disbeliever all the way to late into Medina when he eventually becomes Muslim Suhail bin Amr. But it's important to what to separate them. But Suhail bin Amr still is part of that old order. And who's Ar Rahman? I yani, mean, Ar Rahman. And Uktub Bismika Allahumma. Write Bismika in your name, Allahumma. Oh Allah, and that kama kunta tektum nafsa, as you used to want and recognize. Okay, bismika Allahumma. So again, there were certain sort of manifestations, yani names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the Quraysh were going to deem problematic, beginning of Mecca. So early revelation is careful not to what? Not to um, yani manifest those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until there is some type of sort of ground being achieved with the Prophet Islam's early movement and then more realities come become evident of what the tradition is. And at that point, Quraysh are now going to want step of their enmity towards the Prophet One of the strangest things we will see, uh, inshallah ta'ala, we cover in terms of the theme of today, is that we will see that all, although due, throughout all of this, they still recognize the akhlaq of the Prophet I mean, he's still al-ameen, he's still al Ma'moon, he's still the trustworthy one. That even when the Prophet ﷺ makes the Grand Hijrah, which we're in that period now, and this is our topic today, within the period of the flight of the Prophet ﷺ in the Hijrah, through which time is measured until the Day of Judgment, that's still when one of the last acts, and not the last act of the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, is to instruct Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib to retain back all of these amanat, all of these trusts that the Prophet ﷺ is holding for the people of Mecca, who? But it can't be the believers, because they've already hit Medina, I so the Prophet is holding the trust of disbelievers of Mecca that despite they see him as an object of enmity, somebody who is one who is clearly causing disruption in the old order, the qualities are still very evident. And the Messenger of Allah as a final act wants to ensure that Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib retains every single amana that the Prophet is still holding before he leaves what? Before he leaves Mecca to which Sayyidina Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib fulfills that trust placed upon him. And as soon as he fulfills the last trust, he heads um, straight for Hijrah, Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, which as we'll see, he will meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as entering, Prophet entering Medina to Munawwara. So Sayyidina Ali still gets the great war, the great honor of entering into what, the, the new city, the great city, the archetype city alongside of the messenger himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today's class, inshallah ta'ala, will suffice without um, the slides, so inshallah ta'ala. Let's just forgive us for that, inshallah. And what we were looking at more so here towards Mecca, what becomes very evident is that the, although it's a new order as far as Quraysh is concerned, that it's the old order of prophecy. It's that which the Prophet Sallallahu calls Nubuwat al in the Hadith and the Sahih. Nubuwat al is the old order of prophecy, the prophetic continuum that the Prophet Sallallahu manifests. And as far as history dictates, Okay, history dictates that the Prophet ﷺ, the last part of the continuum before the manifestation of the Messenger ﷺ, it was the manifestation of Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary. And this is going to be the reemergence in one way, in, in, in a sense, of the teachings of Jesus. Although the Prophet ﷺ comes as the Muhammad to complete the teachings of all, of every single one of them. Although the last of that continuum was Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam and the Prophet Sallallahu and the early followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are going to, in a sense, finish the mission of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam upon earth, who likewise, in order, quote unquote, to repay the favor, will what we turn back at the end of time in order to complete the actual mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi which is espoused in the hadith of the Messenger, where he says that, Zuwiyat li al ard, that the earth has been rolled up for me, will say, Yasir, Dini that my religion will reach yani fi maqami hadha he said zuyat lil ardi fi maqami maqami hadha that the earth has been zuyat lil ardu fi maqami hadha that the earth has been rolled up for me in the place where I now stand and he was standing upon the member of Sharif inside the Medina to Munawwara wa sayasul dini la ila ma zuya li minha and my religion shall reach the parts of the earth that was rolled up for me Okay, in one of the Duriwayas, Mashariqaha wa Magharibaha, the east and the west of the earth were rolled up and made manifest to the Prophet ultimately where his deen ultimately reaches and settles. The truest manifestation of that was not in the time of the Prophet The Prophet returns back to Allah Ta'ala and what Islam is still in a sense confined to the, to the Arabian Peninsula. 
ninth year of the Hijrah. That's where we see all of the all of the various Arabian tribes and nearly 45 different tribes of Arabia all go to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and offer either full allegiance through entering into Islam or they offer some type of what um, contract for coexistence, what's called jizya, okay, to be to be citizens of the the new state, the new state of prophecy, but without actually entering into the fold of religion. That's how the Prophet Sallallahu leaves the earth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and thereafter it's the companions who take up on the great mission of being part of those people who are going to fulfill the actual teachings of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon it. So the companions are the one, virtually by the time the companions, the last companion reaches the earth, we have what we know as the Muslim world, virtually. Virtually all settled to this day, what is called the Muslim world. In fact, it's only receded in a sense since, what, since the actual um, movement of the companions beyond the peninsula in and of itself. But still, it's not to the point where يعني, زويت لي الأرض مشارقها ومغاربها it's not what the Prophet Sallallahu saw at the great member. That fulfillment is with the coming of Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. So this, this sort of theme was more so looking at the ranks, understanding that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is not bid'an min al-rusul, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. He's not an innovator of a, of, from amongst messengers, but he's part of a continuum. And he comes to fulfill that which... Um, well, as went before, but more importantly, as you mentioned in the issue of akhlaq, he comes to complete, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to complete the actual uh, edifice of prophecy. As we see it beautifully mentioned in the hadith in the sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa spoke about the people, yatufuna hawl al-qasr, that they begin to uh, to circumambulate, he said, around this beautiful edifice or this beautiful palace. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that they that they they're amazed at its what? At the perfection of its architecture. Until they, they begin to notice collectively that there's a brick missing. The Prophet used to do it, Lebna. Lebna means like an adobe brick, bricks that are made out of more than water. They notice that there's a brick missing and they say that this structure would be perfect if it was not for that brick. You just need to put that one brick in place, then you have a perfect structure. Then the Prophet I mean, in all humility said, We're in the need there, Tilka Lebna. I am what? I am that brick. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I the final brick in the edifice of prophecy. And once it's been placed in, that the actual construction of the edifice of prophecy becomes complete, but not only completed, likewise also perfected. There's a verse in Surah Al-Saf inside of the Quran, the chapter of the ranks, okay? كُونُوا عَنْ يَا نُيُّ الَّذِينَ أَمْنُوا كُونُوا عَنْ صَارَ اللَّهِ كَمَا قَالَ عِيْسَ بِنَا مَرِيَمِ الْحَوَارِيِّينَ مَنْ أَنْصَارِي إِلَى اللَّهِ قَالُوا قَالُوا الْحَوَارِيُّونَ نَحْنُوا أَنْ صَارَ اللَّهِ Okay, believers, be helpers of God, as Jesus, son of Mary, said to the disciples, who will be my helpers to God? Who? Saying Isa ibn Maryam. The disciples said, we will be the helpers of God, the Hwariyun. And a part of the Israelites believed, while a part scoffed. Okay, Banu Israel. We backed those who believed against their enemies, so they became victorious. So this is, inshallah ta'ala, our theme. Because this is one of the verses in the Quran which speaks more so about the continuum as it manifested in the final manifestation of prophecy, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam is addressing elite followers. Okay, the belief that Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam only had what? Twelve people who surrounded him is ba'id jiddan, is extremely what? And unacceptable to believe that one of the great one of the Rusul, one of the great five of the messengers is only going to have, and one of the last of them, is only going to have 12 people who are, who are going to be his loyal followers, one of them being a traitor. That's not, what can, that's not how we understand it in terms of our tradition. But the Hawari Yun are the elite followers of any prophet. Okay? That's why in the hadith, Sahih, the Prophet Sallallahu said, every prophet has a Hawari. Every prophet has those who are called Hawari. That's the word we use for what the disciples in Arabic, the Hawari Yun. And he said, from my Hawari, is saying the Zubair ibn Awam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. Saying the Zubair is considered from the Hawari of the Messenger of Allah. Okay, the elite followers, those who are, the Prophet sallallahu could, could consider as a confidant, that he can teach that which he cannot teach the general corpus of the Sahaba. Saying the Zubair is not like any other Sahaba. For us, he's from the elite 10, which again gives an indication from the elite ten of the Sahaba, those who've been guaranteed what paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and the same with Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. And although what our tradition doesn't put a place a number upon the Hawari Yun, we would understand that they are what an elite 
what um, group of um, students of the Prophet himself, in this case the Prophet said Isa ibn Maryam. The language, the way, in the language of the Arabs, the word comes from purity, okay, and the different, why would they call Hawariyun? Some say it was actually literal. I would say that Isa ibn Maryam actually first engaged all of those initial people who stood around them, that there used to be people who took cloth and dyed cloth, cloth white, I mean, dyed cloth white in the Jordan River. And when Sayyid Ismail Maryam first met them, that's what they were doing. The word Hawari is somebody who can dye something white. Okay? And then others say, no, it, was, it didn't have to do with the profession of them, because that may not apply to all of them. But it was more to do with Hawari Yun, more so being purified beings, illumined beings. A whiteness being a metaphor for one who was illumined. So the Hawariyun are those illumined followers who are who situate themselves around saying Isa ibn Maryam. Men and sorry illallah. Who are those who are my helpers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Ansar, which ordinarily is what the, the religion of Sayyid Isa ibn Maryam is characterized by. That's why they're the Nasrani. Nasrani from the same word Ansar, those who give victory to God. The disciples, the Hawariyun said, We will be helpers of God. And a part of the Israelites believed, whilst a part scoffed. Okay? And that's then Allah Ta'ala says, And we back those who believed against their enemies, so they became victorious. Okay? In terms of Banu Israel, the Israelites who say that Isa ibn Maryam was sent to, sent to, they were the people of like through his mother's lineage, who they were sent to, okay, the Israelites, that were a part of them believed, very few of them, Believed in Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, whilst a part scoffed, I rejected the vast majority, disbelieved, denied Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. So we back those who believed against their enemies, okay? So they became victorious. Well, who became victorious? The followers of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam? No. Yani khalas, nobody will ever say that the followers of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, either Hawariyun, became victorious. So that's why the ulama of Islam say that this does not apply, the latter part of the verse does not apply to Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam and his disciples, because they, for all intended purposes, they're going to be basically wiped off the face of the earth, wiped off human history, due to the fact that they face an empire who what, has yani, not only enmity, but also has more power than they do, such that what? The, the teachings of Jesus disappears. And within three centuries, Christianity cannot be recognized. Okay, I, the true teachings of Jesus cannot be recognized upon the face of the earth. And such that when we get to 325 and what's called the Council of Nicaea, they ratify yani, what are the official teachings of the church. Okay, that's what the holy quote-unquote Roman emperor does. Ratifies the official teachings of the church. And anything that opposes that is the type of Christianity that ultimately will be buried at the stake. Yani, will be what sent to the lions. And that's what the early history of Christianity. And as we alluded to in the beginning, the manifestation of Islam yani, the, under the Prophet وسلم, has a radically different beginning. Radically different. And we don't mean Mecca. Okay, because the Prophet is still alive, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The important point to judge it is with the departure of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to Rafiq al-Ala, to the higher company. This is the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, what? Departs, the disciples are immediately on the run. They're on the run, okay? And to the point that they run off what? The face of the earth, world history. They disappear, okay? It becomes a very, very covert movement, centered initially in, in Alexandria, what, is, what they know is the first Christian church. And then we're going to see that completely broken apart by the minds of the Holy Roman Empire. The Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ, when he returned to Rafiq al-Ala, he has raised one of the greatest armies that he ever raised, awaiting to go and fight the Holy Roman Empire. Radically different army, which was led by Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd. And when the Prophet ﷺ returns back to Allah Ta'ala, and Abu Bakr, within hours... Of the word, the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, assumes the mantle of Khilafah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda, his first act as Caliph is now to what to release the army of Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd towards Rome. And that is extremely symbolic because thereafter, now it's not the Sahaba who are going to be on the run, they're not going to be on the run, but it's more so the Roman Empire that's going to be on the run, which becomes the critical reason why the Rome, why the Christianity has, until the day of judgment, a hatred, I mean, official church doctrine, and those who are, who you speak on behalf of official doctrine, they have an inbuilt hatred of Islam because of what happens in the formative period. What they know is the Christian world and the centers of Christendom, one by one, with only one exception, are going to remain in Christian hands. And that sort of tantamount towards the Muslims now, we've lost 
all rationality with Quds, because it's the center of Islam, it's the third holy site. We've lost rationality with Quds, yani, and we can't even think straight with Quds, because that's Quds. That's the Mahbat al-Anbiya, the place of prophets. Okay? And how about the Christians? When they lose Quds, okay? The Jews lose Quds. How about the Christians when they lose Alexandria? How about the Christians when they lose Antioch? How about the Christians when they lose what? Constantinople? And we start comparing that to what happens if now after Quds, Medina goes. Oh, honey. You know, we're not going to like those who took Medina. We're not going to like those who took Quds. And what about if they could get their grubby hands upon Mecca? Then, khalas, it's like do or die for the Muslims at that point in time. That sort of tantamount to what happened within a hundred, yani not within a hundred years, but up to the final fall in like Constantinople in 1492, of the fall of all of these key places of what? Of Christendom. That they themselves have never recovered from that. And they have an inbuilt enmity towards what? Towards the Muslims because of that. Okay, so when we back those who believed, who did the ulama say this is? This is the manifestation of the Prophet wasallam, And that is substantiated historically. It's not sort of theory here. Hans Kung in his book Christianity, one of the things that he makes mention of is the true teachings of Jesus as a Christian theologian, that the true teachings of Jesus السلام, disappeared completely off the face of the earth. And he pointed to Arabia, that the, what, the only place the disciples and the followers of the early disciples, the earliest Christian church, could find homage, safety from the attacks of the Romans was Arabia, which just makes complete sense, the history of Arabia. The Romans don't go into Arabia Okay, Arabia is just too treacherous. The people there are too wild, too wild to go into Arabia. They don't historically ever go into Arabia, the Romans. Even when we look at the Prophet Sallallahu wars with the Romans, that they raise, at Murta, they raise 300,000 strong army, but, but they're still in the Levant. They don't go beyond the sands of Arabia into what we would call Arabia in and of itself. 300,000 and you're just standing on the borders with all of that army. Not one army, even with the messenger of Allah, of, of those battles fought inside of what we call the heart of Arabia. They all fought way borders in, in, in the borders where they conquered up to the further south, being a place called Busra, which was the provincial war in capital of war of, of the of the Byzantium um, in the, the Byzantium Empire, the Roman Empire inside of Arabia, but not in the heart of Arabia. Zan so Kung is going to posit historical fact that they all disappeared inside of Arabia. And what sort of aids our sort of discussion here? He says, and then the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam completely disappear off the face of the earth. And he says, they do not resurface except with the manifestation of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, six centuries later. Now that, it's not just a Christian speaking, and not just a Christian theologian speaking, but that is who they call the greatest Catholic theologian in the last hundred years speaking. I mean, it's a very, very authoritative word. And what we take from that, whatever he meant by that, and did he mean the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, someone we've got to ask him? Or does he mean those um, monotheists, the Hunafa, who we clearly see manifest, who you, we discuss about, the likes of Waraq ibn Nawfal, Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, Tus bin, Ay- bin Sa'id al-Ayyadi, those people who are people who, who are with the original teachings of the Prophet and of themselves, despite context, does he mean them? Does he mean the likes of Bahira, Nustura, Isa, those monotheistic monks who were there inside of what? monotheists inside of Arabia, preserving the last teachings of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, which is a historical fact from our tradition likewise. Allah Ta'ala alam. But what's clear, we don't hear of the teachings of Jesus until in and about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu That's when it resurfaces on the world history, on the stage of world history. But then that's one thing, okay? But in the verse in the Quran, nobody's going to say the Christian monks in Arabia were victorious. No one's going to say that what? Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, Waraka ibn Nawfal, Qus bin Sa'ida, yani, Umay ibn Abi Salt. Those manifest, they were victorious. But victory clearly comes in the form of the manifestation of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And that's why Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, just in a few verses prior to this, yani, I give you glad tidings of a messenger that will come after me whose name is Ahmed, the Prophet Muhammad What is the emphasis here about victory? Okay, and Islam makes no apologies for it. It's not only a reality of the Prophet Muhammad but it's a reality of any prophecy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give temkeen upon the face of the earth. What is that? War. Okay? 
war becomes an inevitable reality because it's only so long, it's only for so long that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to prescribe what we could call in the Christian terms, tearing the other cheek. And the Prophet sallallahu remember, as a messenger, as a prophet, he turns the other cheek for a lot longer than saying Isa ibn Maryam did as a standing prophet on the face of the earth. The Prophet for 13 years turned the other cheek, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. And that turning the other cheek is part of, in our last session, as the manifest, of the manifestation of true akhlaq. The true akhlaq comes in the face of adversity. And it doesn't come through retaliation in legal means in the face of adversity, but it comes through the great principles such as forbearance, such as clemency, such as forgiveness in the face of adversity from one's quote-unquote enemies. But then the point comes where now it's beyond your own personal safety, but it's about now the safety and the protection of religion in and of itself. And what's going to be important in only two years into Medina, that the Prophet ﷺ in his dua, which tells us Allah about the state of affairs at that point in time, when he makes a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in tuhlak hadhil usma, len tu'abad fil ard. That if this small group of people, 313 people, are destroyed today, you will never be worshipped on the face of planet Earth again. The dua of the Messenger ﷺ to Allah, jalla fil ula, which shows us the fragility at that point in time, but also it shows us the great miracles that manifest upon the Prophet Islam's hands. And you cannot account for it within a seven year period from the point of the entire nation. Religion could be vanquished to the point where now it's Temkin, nothing's going to vanquish it. It's there, totally what? Fortified through what? The divine assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the things we make mention of here, Imam al-Qurta, we make mention of in the tafsir of the verse, that this emphasizes the affair of war. He says, this is what this slide says. This emphasizes the affair of war. I, like Ibn Taymiyyah, Abu Abbas Ahmed Ibn Taymiyyah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, religion that has temkeen, yani upon the face of the earth, temkeen means it's given authority upon the face of the earth, that it always has two things. It has al-kitab al-hadi wa saif al-nasir. Same word that we use about the ansar nasir. It has al-kitab al-hadi, which is the, the book that guides, the guiding book. Wa saif al-nasir, it has the sword that what brings victory, gives victory. Okay? I.e. protects the religion. And that's one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sends what the final universal message, the one that must be preserved, he sends it to a nation of warriors, people who, are, who know well, yani very well, how to protect that which is inside of their hands. And that's going to be something that contradicts yani all other war prophecy. It's not necessarily sent to nations of warriors, but ordinarily it's sent to the underdog, okay, the underdog, and it's quickly vanquished the teachings of the prophets themselves. Okay? Prophets stand on the day of judgment with zero followers. I mean, what's all that about? Prophets stand on the day of judgment with one person behind them. What's all that about? Okay? Uh, prophets are those who were killed and murdered. And what's that about? Cave. Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, alayhi salam, as powerful as Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam is, has to what has divine and angelic assistance and escape to the heavens. When people come to assassinate the great what Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, alayhi salam. So he says this emphasizes the affair of war. I, Allah Ta'ala is saying, be true disciples of your prophet so that God may grant you victory over those that contravene you in the same way that he granted the disciples of Jesus victory over those that contravene them. Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, and Nafi'ah, these are three of the, the ways um, that the Quran is recited. Abu Kathir, Abu Amr, and Nafi'ah. Read this as be helpers for the sake of God. Not be helpers of God. Kunu ansar Allah. I know the in other um, um, readings of the Quran. Kunu ansaran lilla. That's a valid reading of the Quran. Kunu ansaran lilla. Be what helpers for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He is clearly alluding to what the intention, the intention that people should hold. They say this is because its meaning is to be firm and be willing helpers for the sake of God by means of the sword against your enemies by means of the sword against your enemies. Disciples are the elect adherents of the prophets. Ma'mar, one of the great interpreters of the Quran said, and this is how they were, praise be to God, i.e. that they assisted him 
and they were 70 men in number, okay? Who, and who is he speaking about here? Some of the Hawariyun of the Prophet himself, وسلم, some of the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he said, and this is how they were, praise be to God, الحمد, in that they insisted, they assisted him, and they were 70 in number, 70 men in number, and then the opinion of Muhammad, they being the ones that took the oath of allegiance with him on the night of Al-Aqaba, which again is, is towards the end of Mecca, clearly ushering the, what the reality, awaited reality, that Allah will, subhanahu wa ta'ala will lift the restraint from the hands of the believers, and other believers will be sanctioned to what, first and foremost, retaliate for those who were, who did them wrong and cast them out of their houses and misappropriated their wealth, and thereafter what, for it to become what many ulama consider offensive, okay, in terms of what, guiding the spread of the religion, or guarding the spread of the religion in and of itself. Okay, Aqaba. Aqaba, it was also said that they were from Quraysh, with Imam Qatada, okay, meaning, yani mentioning each of them by name, Abu Bakr, yani Siddiq, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Zubair ibn Awam, Sa'ad ibn Malik, Abu Ubaidah, whose name was, was Amir, Uthman ibn Mad'un, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and although he never mentioned Sa'id, i.e. Sa'id ibn Zu, ibn Ibn um, Zub, Sa'id ibn Zayd from amongst them, he did however mention Ja'far ibn Abi Talib as Imam al-Qurtubi brings the rewire about who they are, okay, these the elite followers of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and victory, no doubt, came through those elite individuals through those elite individuals, okay Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas he said, God assisted those that believed in the times of Jesus by manifesting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a in opposition to the religion of the disbelievers, okay, the manifestation of whom of Satan of, of the of the continual prophecy in the form of the messenger himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Towards the end of Mecca, no doubt things get very difficult, okay, and that difficulty <coughs> is going to mean that what, yeah, this this the second great stage of what of the. Temkeen or the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become manifested upon the earth is going to be quickly ushered in. It comes after a period of great trial and difficulty inside of Mecca, i.e. from the seventh year to the tenth year of what of prophecy. Seventh year to the tenth year of prophecy, i.e. the Prophet from forty-seven years of age to fifty years of age, that the Prophet himself, وسلم, and those who surround him are going to be cast out of Mecca, <laughs> which is a sign of things to come, and they're going to be placed in a place which is called the Shirb. Okay, the, the canyon that is behind the house of Abu Talib, where they live in the wilderness for three entire years, it became extremely difficult for them, that nobody was out, allowed to marry them, nobody was allowed to trade with them, nobody was allowed to supply them with any types of food, and that the, the dominant staple of the Prophet Islam and those who are with him, believers and disbelievers, because certain elements of, of people of disbelief were also forced to follow the Prophet ﷺ into the wilderness due to what they considered, the Quraysh considered tribal alliances. So in particular here, members of Banu Hashim and members also of Banu Muttalib. The entire tribes, with very few exceptions, were also cast out of Mecca alongside of the Sahaba themselves. Okay? And the staple diet in that time becomes that which animals eat. I mean, the, the foliage, that which grows upon earth. Okay? And that's what they eat. It's just that one of the Hawariyun was made mention of here, his name is Sa'ad bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala an, okay, the great um, Sahaba, Sa'ad Nabi Waqas, the Sa'ad Nabi Waqas made mention that at that time, that when we would what, answer the call to nature, what would come out of us is what would come out of animals. It looked exactly the same, due to the fact that what they ate is that which what, is that which animals ate. But this is necessary in terms of the tarbiyah of true people who Allah ta'ala grants authority to, and who says that the Imam himself saying the Sa'an Nabi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala and he would mention many of the chronicles of those times. He would speak about the time where what where, where that he said, Once I went to answer the call to nature, and as I'm squatting, my hand falls upon something. So I look and it's a rotten, dead sort of skin, animal skin, like leather, dead gone. And he said, I took it, washed it, grilled it, and we ate it. That became the type of food that they ate. And then Sayyidina Sa'id Nabi Waqas, who later recounts, later on in his Islam, who is he? He's one of the great Imams of, he's one of the Bhutan, he's one of the Hawari, disciples of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Persia, what's Wara'a al-Nahar, 
This is Sa'id Nabi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala an, the armies that he takes, Qadisiya, the great army, the great battle with the Persian. Sa'id Nabi Waqas, he's the one who conquers what opens up Iraq. So now Sa'id Nabi Waqas, he builds Kufa, the cities of Kufa are built at his hands under the command of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab. And when he's placed in Kufa, he's placed as the governor of Kufa, after building the city of Kufa, Sayyidina Sa'id Nabi Waqas, the great Sahaba, one of the ten guaranteed paradise, that they begin to what? They begin to speak about him and religion. Okay, and it, I, that the Iraqis, Kufans who had moved into Kufa, thought that they knew something better about Deen Allah than somebody who had suhbat of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and graduated from the very madrasa of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why in a beautiful tradition in Tirmidhi, Sayyidina Sayyidina Abi Waqas speaks about the times of difficulty in Mecca, that I'm, my character was forged in Mecca. And he said, in every single one of us, in one tradition, he said there was nine of us around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when there was fear for our very existence and our hands were restrained. And he said, every single one of us have became leaders inside of Islamic polity, trying to show you the prerequisites for true leadership on, upon the face of the earth, divine leadership, those who do the bidding of Allah Ta'ala and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he says, like, chilling with, what was a yujerribun al umaram in bin ba'dina, that they're going to taste leaders after us. You, and you will see what it means when people are given authority and they've not had proper training. They've not came out of the quote-unquote, and I won't say fairness, but they've not came out of the madrasa of prophecy in and of itself. Which Sa'id was clearly one of those, radiallahu ta'ala. And he said, what does it become? He said, when, we, when people take the likes of me to account for religion, what's it become? He said, at that point, it's all finished and everyone's in a state of bankruptcy. He says, radiallahu ta'ala, and who were the so they were forged, these are not the early believers who were forged inside of that difficult period. And it's no um, coincidence that every single one of the ten come out of this period. And their characters are Meccan characters, they characters that are forged inside of what? The extreme difficulty, and that's as we could call it, the fairness of Mecca. That their metals are what? Are purified inside of the fairness of Mecca. Difficult times. End of the tenth year, the Prophet Sallallahu is going to be yani, forced to leave Mecca. The first flight from Mecca that the Prophet Islam has, and that's because the only tribal protector that will be respected inside of Medina for the Mecca for the Prophet Islam is Abu Talib. And Abu Talib dies. And within three days, the other great emotional and likewise financial support of the Prophet Islam is that Khadija bin Khawalid al Kubra, that she likewise dies within three days. That is the tenth year after prophecy, three years before Hijra. So it becomes dire for the Prophet. ﷺ. But the most important thing in terms of the early mission, there is no protection. Yani whether yani we understand that it's a sword or not, but it means now for the first time there's the absence of a sword. That which guards the actual early message. And that's the first time it's gonna happen inside of ten years, which now for the Quraysh that the Prophet ﷺ becomes open target, open target. So the Prophet Islam then is going to make the first flight from where? From Mecca. And he leaves for Ta'if. And the Prophet Wasallam is there at Ta'if in order to bring the great tribe of Thaqif into what? Into Islam. That perhaps they will be a what? A place of homage, a protection for the early faith. Okay? Thaqif are going to make what fun of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Wasallam. And the Prophet even what asks Thaqif, the leaders of Thaqif, yani if, you, if you're going to accept, it's good. But what's important about its next statement, but if you don't keep the conversation between us, don't let this become common knowledge, because the Prophet knows there's ramifications, because the Quraysh and Faqif are not the best of friends. And for the Prophet ﷺ to go to Banu Faqif, the, the, the rulers of Ta'if, in order to seek their assistance in this matter, to them, to the, to the Prophet won't understand, the Quraysh are not going to want, they're going to attack trees into the Quraysh on their, on their behalf. But what happens? The Qif are not going to keep it quiet. And they're going to what? They're going to be people who show like, yani, un, in a sense, it could be considered unforgivable enmity to the Prophet Sallallahu except that he's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi so nothing's unforgivable. Okay? And that's when Sayyidat Aisha asked about Uhud. Was Uhud the worst day of your life? She asked the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, La, ذَاكَ يَوْمُ الثَّقِيف he said that was the day of Thaqif, i.e. the day of Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ said, when he stood in Thaqif for one month, and then he was cast out, humiliated by the leaders, and then they were, then they gathered the idiots and the Majaneen, the mad people and the children of the city, to stone the Prophet ﷺ, stone him till they're drawing blood from his blessed body ﷺ, and the only thing the Prophet ﷺ, can show due consideration for is that his blood 
does not fall upon the upon the land of Taif. Because when the blood of prophets fall upon the lands of, of a place, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send chastisement upon. Which is a sign that the Prophet sallallahu when the first time we see him now turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in absolute abasement, the du'a of Ta'if, the very famous du'a of Ta'if, the oh, oh, yani, oh Allah, in the eshku ilayka, oh Allah, I complain to you, yani da'afu qawwati, my, yani, the weak, my weakness of strength, wa qillatu hilati, and my lack of stratagem, wa hawari ala nas, people view me as insignificant, as nothing. That's what Prophet is saying in his great du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa la tasqat alayya, fala ubali. Look at, look at the resolve of the great soul. So long as you are not angry with me, I couldn't care less about anything else. All this means nothing to me. I, I can stand in the face of this so long as this is not a sign of your wrath upon me. The Prophet ﷺ says, but then he shows Bashariya, he shows his humanness. But your war, your afia, your healing, your well being is, is vast. I, I who looks forward to this type of treatment? It doesn't prove anything that you're going through that type of treatment, the Prophet is saying. Nobody should look forward to that type of treatment. But if it comes, just be patient. And so long as it's not a sign of wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then as he says, it's all good, but I'm human. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi says, and what's critical about that dua, it flips at that point. Because the lowest point, ah, especially when you're looking at a point of descent, in terms of antagonism and violence towards the Prophet ﷺ, is also the beginning of ascent. And no doubt that is the critical change inside of what, what begins to happen thereafter. First and foremost, Allah Ta'ala sends angels. The angels descend. And different types of angels, angels of mountains and all that, begin to de descend, descend. And the Prophet ﷺ is instructed, give them the command. And Allah Ta'ala will take al-Akhshabain, the mountains that surround Ta'if. Ta'if is a mountainous city, okay, in the Hijaz, in the actual Hijaz, the western frontier of Arabia. And he will take the mountains and place them on top of the people of Ta'if. And the Prophet says, La. He says, no. That perhaps from these, the loins of these people, these wretched folk, will come people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it wasn't from their loins, although, so, although that held true, it was the people themselves. I, before the Prophet وسلم, returns back to Allah Ta'ala, the people of Ta'if have came to Medina okay, and submitted to the Messenger of Allah. Alayhi okay? And then as the Prophet وسلم, leaves, the Prophet then goes, well, where does he head straight? Because now, where can he go? Mecca has rejected him, Ta'if has rejected him. The Prophet وسلم, where, where does he go to? He goes to Hira. He goes back to the cave of Hira alayhi وسلم, and he remains inside of Hira. And then alongside him is his great sort of confidant, Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha, one of the most important of the Sahaba, who many of us maybe don't even know of, or maybe don't take him seriously in terms of who he was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the great traditions which says it all about Sayyidina Zayd, radiallahu ta'ala, is hadith in al-Bukhari, that had Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha, and he outlived the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he dies, he's martyred in Mu'tah. Had he outlived the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would have been the first caliph of Islam. Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, about Sayyidina Zayd, as a giant of the Sahaba, and he's someone who keeps the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from way back before the advent of Islam. Way back. He's called Hibb al-Rasul, the most beloved of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nobody has that title but him. I mean, that's a great sort of accolade for him. So Sayyidina Zayd is now sent into what? He's sent into, um, into Mecca. And no doubt Sayyidina Zayd, who's considered because his history is slavery, he's not going to have like the negotiating powers that are going to be needed on this mission of the Prophet So the Prophet then asks Sayyidina Zayd to go to a certain Abdullah ibn Uraiqit. Now Abdullah ibn Uraiqit, who's a strange fellow, because Abdullah ibn Uraiqit is clearly one of those people who are ethical, but like la yu'raf islamuhu, but nobody ever knew whether he became Muslim. That's why I say Ibn Hajj al Asqalani is not going to consider him from amongst the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Uraiqit. Okay, but he plays critical roles at very critical times, and he must have been somebody who the Prophet deeply trusted. Because some of the information he had, the very life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu rested upon it. So Sayyidina Zayd was told to go to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Uraiqid, Abdullah ibn Uraiqid, who was then going to negotiate protection, the sword for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi And then he goes to several different people, from amongst them as we mentioned, Suhail bin Amr. Every single one of them reject. 
but they reject based upon, oh, I have no power inside the Meccan society, or the Quraysh won't listen to me. They give excuses. So the sign of that, it wasn't enemies. It was people who, in a sense, understood that the Prophet ﷺ was an ethical man, and what was happening to him was wrong. Until they come to a Satan, yani, a Mut'im, and Ibn Adi, Mut'im Ibn Adi, where they come to, come to him, and what he does, as soon as Abdullah ibn Rayk tells him what is needed, protection for the Prophet ﷺ, he takes to steal, he arms himself, and instructs all of his sons, arm yourself. And they all armed themselves, and they went to the what? They marched straight to the Kaaba, and they instruct the Mala, the assembly of Quraysh, that Muhammad is under our protection. He's under our protection. And anybody who doesn't like it, then khalas. Yani, they're not restrained, because they're disbelievers. Okay? So at that point, the Quraysh say, well, you've got it, khalas. He's under your protection. And the Prophet then saying the Zayd, then will ascend back to Hira, and he'll inform the Prophet of the new protection granted, and that's how he he enters back into Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallama. Tayyib, but it's not going to be safe. Because Mut'im is not Abu Talib. Eh? He's not Abu Talib. Okay, it's still not going to be safe, and the Quraysh are going to seek ways to circumvent the protection of Mut'im. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is well aware of this. And then the Prophet Sallallahu on that basis is going to what? Seek pastors anew. Okay? Seek pastors anew, i.e. why he understands that he doesn't have long left inside of Mecca. So activity is going to be what? Increased inside of what? Inside of the great festivals, inside of what? Mecca. Okay? The Iqad, Dhul Majaz, Majinna, and others. The great, in the time of Hajj, when all of Arabia comes, and that's where you'll see the increased activity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engage in all of the various tribes of Arabia. And from amongst them, he engages Banu Hanifa, the tribe of Musaylim al Kadhab, from the, from, the, from the Najd, from the high plateaus of Arabia. And that's when Musaylim tries to negotiate with the Prophet, yani, the Mulk. If you give me the affair after you, then khalas, I will, I will give you what? I'll give you allegiance now. You see, if you divide, the Prophet says, the Mulk, lillah, give you allegiance. And yani, give the affair after you. The Mulk, lillah, Allah gives it to whom he pleases. Say me ask, well, let's split the affair into one. You're the prophet of the Hijaz and the prophet of what? I'm the prophet of him. Of, of, um, of uh, Prophet of Rahman, he calls himself. Okay? Of, of, um, of, of Yamama. The prophet al Mulk, nothing is given to you. And again, what's important about that? Because yani, Musaylim and his people were people of best power. Yani, meaning, if, if the prophet says them, and you see some people, that he was a very shrewd politician. You see that he, this wasn't true, but it was very, very shrewd. That at a point of weakness inside of society, where you're looking yani, for somebody to want to give you homage, yani, that, that could have been a good, you know what I mean? Why not give him, give him prophecy after you, or give him leadership after you, whatever it could be. Well, I won't give you prophecy, that's a loss, but I'll give you leadership. You're the affair after me, you could be the first caliph, or have you. He could have went into negotiation, and the Prophet Islam doesn't. At that weak point, are you going to see Kemp? And in ninth year after Hijrah, Musaylimah comes again to Medina to Munawwara. He comes to Medina. The Prophet's got a Sahaba called Thabit bin Qais. And the Prophet Sallallahu is walking with a little stick. He has a stick he's walking with. And then, Musay- then he stands in front of Musaylimah al Kadhab. And Musaylimah al Kadhab is trying to utter the same old nonsense. He's got all of what Banu Anifa with him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, If you, yani, because he's asking for mulk again, dominion, authority. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, If you ask me for this stick, I wouldn't give you it. Yani, never mind dominion, I wouldn't give you this stick. And then the Prophet says, rather than getting into conversation, he says, Ehu a thabit. Here in front of me is Thabit bin Qais, you can limuka. He'll speak to you and throw some walks and saying the Thabit then is the one who's got a like, Thabit, one of the great orators of the Prophet, is the one who's got to speak to Banu Hanifa about Islam. And Banu Hanifa reject. And obviously the sword of Khalid ibn Walid is going to be what? Unleashed against them in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. So he rejects any type of what? Compromise. Okay? And then the first signs we're going to see are going to be the signs of what? Of the great tribes of the Ansar from Medina. And what's important about the tribes of the Ansar <coughs> is that the tribes of the Ansar, they're going to manifest after the what's called the Isra al Mi'raj, the ascent of the Prophet sallallahu which we dealt with, didn't we, last year. We had a class on Islam there, Raj, if I remember. I think we had to cancel it. Or did we cancel it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, because the Israel Mi'raj, that's the ascent of the Prophet beyond the seven heavens. And that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's return 
What are we going to see? Part of what he sees on Israel Mi'raj, in fact, it's not part, it's the very first thing he sees, sallallahu alayhi wa is where he's going to be making hijrah to. Where is he going to? Because remember, this is the point. He knows that there has to be some type of flight from Mecca, and it can't be to the nearest place, which is Ta'if, fortress. There has to be something else. Okay? And then when the Prophet takes flight with Sayyidina Jibreel and Mikhail, Israel Mi'raj, the very first place they stop, the Prophet asks, yani, where is this? And Sayyidina Jibreel says, Ard Mahjarat. This is the place where you're going to be commanded to migrate onto. The very first place he goes to is Medina to Manawara, then known as Yathrib. And the Prophet Sallallahu when he looked at it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just sees a place of Vert and Nakhal. Okay? And it was, it was his knowledge that it was Medina to Manawara evident? Allah Ta'ala Alam. But what, in one riwayah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I, what I thought it was Hajar. The place we went to, where is Hajar? Hajar is now what's called the modern day Ahsa, Damam, Eastern Saudi Arabia. He actually thought it was Hajar, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But as time's going to unfold, that it was actually Medina Manawara that he was taken to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's what's going to be important about that. It becomes clear that he's, that he's about to leave Mecca. So therefore, the, he's going to expose himself to the various what, winds okay, of, of, of divine descent. In the form of what the great Hajj's activities increased, and that we're going to see in the year, in the twelfth year, the tribes of the Ansar, it's called the Aus and the Khazraj, are going to enter into what Hajj, and they're going to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a from their leaders, going to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Why are they going to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an Because of they have just came out of a, of a of the most devastating war in their history which is known as the, the, the War of Bu'af. It's a war in which virtually every single leader of the Ansar was killed, of the Aus and the Khazraj, both sides. Virtually all of them were killed. Okay, So it took out all of the elders, all political, economical, and also what? military leadership. Okay, And leadership was then going to be thrust into the hands of like 20-year-olds and 24-year-olds because all their fathers had been killed. Okay, is that a problem? Why, why is that a problem for the people of Medina? Because they have this perennial war with the Jews for authority in Medina. And the Jews have economic control over what is called Yathrib, the former place of Medina, the former name of Medina. But they have perennial war with them. And the Jews are always what? looking for new ways to go back to war with the Ansar. But one of the things the Jews are always want to mention to the Ansar, because they lose every time, Every time they go to war, they lose. The Jews always lose with the Ansar. But they say, don't worry, because the day is coming soon when the prophet of the end of time will manifest. And he comes to this place, they used to tell, threaten the Ansar with. And what? He's a monotheist, not an idolater like you. And he's going to give us victory. So this becomes etched into the minds of the war of the Ansar. It becomes something folkloric. The parents teach the children. And so what the children understand that when the parents are wiped out as a generation, that's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَذْكُرُ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ in Surah Ali Imran. And Allah ta'ala those verses in Ali Imran, Allah saying, when you were enemies, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةً مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَضُكُمْ مِنْهَا You were on the, 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 the cliffs of hell. And Allah saved you from it. Allah Ta'ala speaking on the war of Bu'ath that ravaged of enmity between the tribes, the Ansar themselves, Aus and the Khazraj. So now weakness with the Jews, when they get to Medina, and then there's the one who's saying, I'm the prophet at the end of time. I'm the prophet at the end of, I'm the prophet at the end of time. They give it an ear. Okay, they give that an ear. Okay, and they believe, X amount are going to believe, and they're going to take an oath with the Prophet Wasallam. More notably, it's the end of the Meccan period for us. The great themes of Mecca. The first oath is called Bay'atun Nisa. It's called the allegiance of women. And why is it called the allegiance of women? Okay? Two opinions, both appropriate for our context. The first is because there's no contract for war, there's no mention of war inside of the allegiance. So that's what he said the oath of women, because women don't fight in war. Reason number one. Reason number two, yani bay'atun nisa, is because yani the jalliyat, the manifestations of what of attributes, lordly attributes of feminine in, in the world of duality. So bay'atun nisa is the war, the, uh, the allegiance of attributes, the allegiance of virtues, and the virtuous allegiance. And that's what the answer to take with the Prophet. 
The following year, the Ansar, when they head back to Medina, they're going to impress upon what the Ansar in and of themselves, many of the Ansar to become Muslim, to actually become Muslim, okay? To which many do. And the Prophet, in order to assist that process, he sends the great companion, say the Mus'ab ibn Umayr, who had fled Mecca, had made hijrah to what? To Abyssinia. And he's what? He's going to be, quote unquote, recalled from Abyssinia and then sent where? To Medina to Munawwara, in order to begin to teach the religion to the, to the early people, call them teach and to call the society. And what Musab achieves is unprecedented because he takes an entire society with very few followers. Yani, they became Muslim, less than a hundred, turns it on its head. The entire society enters into Islam when the Sayyidina Musab ibn Umayr. Sayyidina Musab would just sit on the trees. He wouldn't even go and speak to people. Yani, because what he understood, yani, it's, it's like the beauty that when, yani, when monotheism enters into, into a, a situation of, what, of polytheism or disbelief, it's going to yani, cause some type of you know, ruffle the feathers of people who have a vested interest in power. So Sayyidina Musab used to sit in Medina understanding, they're going to come to me. I'm teaching people monotheism. The trouble's coming to me. I don't need to come to it. And lo and behold, the chiefs would all come to Sayyidina Musab ibn Umayr. And one beautiful one, one was called Husayd. And Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, famous Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. They were chiefs of the house. And saying the Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, and saying the Husayd, he says to Husayd, Sa'ad says, Go, this one who's causing problems in the city, erect the, you know, eject him from the city. So Husayd goes, he said, he takes like he arms himself with a spear, and he goes up to saying the Mus'ab ibn Umayr, and he says, yani, What you're teaching is not welcome inside of Yathrib, leave. You have to leave. This is the chief of the Oaths, okay, youngster. And then what saying the Mus'ab says, I mean, I'm only speaking some words. And he said, Look, I'll tell you what. Let me just tell you what I'm teaching. If you like it, we can speak some more. And if you don't, I'll leave. I will gladly leave. And that's sort of amazing for him to say, I will get up and leave if you don't like what I'm going to tell you. That is like a diff that's a different type of swagger, a different type of confidence saying the Musa'ib radiallahu ta'ala has. And the Hindri wire that Hussein looks at him and says, you're a fair man, aren't you? That's a very balanced man to actually say, if I don't like it, you'll leave. And it's, there's no... And he doesn't see it's going to be a struggle here. Hussein, he, can do right. he takes hold of his, of his spear and he throws it into the ground. And then he just sits, Yarba, he sits cross-legged. What have you got to say? By the time Sayyidina Musa's finished, La ilaha illallah, <laughs> Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he gets up and then leaves, he leaves. And then Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad's waiting for him. This is the great Sa'ad, the one when he dies, Allah's throne shakes for his death. Huge Sahaba, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said, he's sitting. If I see Husayd return, and he says he has a different type of light, he looks different. What's, I mean, it's amazing, his face, like, he looks different. What's happened? And then he, he says, Husayd walks up to him, gives him the spear, and says, Your turn. <laughs> you better go and speak to him, not me. So Sayyidina Sa'ad goes, and it's just a rerun. How do you want? Leave town. Oh, it's only a word if you like it. Because then we can speak more, otherwise I'll leave. Same thing, Sa'ad, fair man, sits down. Finishes, khalas, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Sayyidina Sa'ad, then, this is the power of leadership, goes back and gathers the entire house, and he asks the house, who am I? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, Amiruna. Now, he's the great Sa'ad, remember when he's on his deathbed, at the, after the battle of, at, on, on the, the of, of, of um, Qureva, on the battle of Qureva, after, after Khandaq, when he walks into the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba rose sitting, the Prophet says, Kumu li Sayyidikum. Everybody stand for your master. When Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad enters, the Prophet commands all the Sahaba to stand for him. When he walks in, he's injured, he's been hit in the battle of Khandaq, one of great stature. And this is shown here, he tells the entire house, who am I? You're the great Sa'ad, you're the one, the man of noble virtues, your father was a man of noble virtues. He said, okay. I am a Muslim, and this is Islam, and if you do not believe, I will not speak to a single one of you again. They all uttered the shahada, the entire house, and say the Mus'ab is just sitting beneath a tree. Uh, the power of the great Da'i himself, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, and the society is totally prepared. And then, in the following one, which is going to be the last sort of the Hajj before the Prophet Islam is going to make sort of moves from Mecca, the great Hijrah, is that then they retain back some of the leaders of the, of the Ansar are going are gonna to retain back for Hajj. Because it's not just about being Muslim, it's also about allegiance. That's important. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were two things upon you. 
First is the adding, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the second now, you have to take allegiance to, a lead, to the leader of the state of God. Okay, the one who has the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of planet Earth. That's what the allegiance is about. Okay, so they go back to Medina and then they're going to meet the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam at Aqaba. He tells them, meet me at Aqaba. Okay. Which is between like Muna and Mecca. It's a rock just between Muna and Mecca and in the Haram of Mecca. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ instructs him to meet them there and he says, Be careful that when you leave, nobody who's from amongst you who's came for Hajj knows that you've left if and if they're not Muslim. No non Muslim should know that you've left. Prophet gives them strict um, instructions. And so what do they do? They wait in the midst of the night when everybody's gone to sleep during the Hajj. And then they what they leave for Aqaba to meet the Prophet Sallallahu where he stands at Aqaba with whom Sayyidina Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Then Abbas is alongside the Prophet Sallallahu and there they take the second oath, which is called Yani Bay'atul Harb, the allegiance of war. And again that becomes it becomes very clear what's going to transpire two years later. I need the permission for for Allah on, on behalf of Allah Ta'ala for what the believers now to what to wage war upon those who oppress them. Okay? And they take it, and before they take it, in order to, that they understand what they're doing, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib stops them and says, "Don't stretch your hand forth to my me- my nephew unless what you are under- you understand the ramifications of what he's about to do." And the Ansar is like, "We know war, and we are people of war. Move your hand out of the way." And they walk. They all take the bay out of war with the Prophet on the basis of that, khalas and part of the bayah is they will protect the Prophet with that which they protect themselves and their wives and their children. I, they will lose their lives over this in protection of the Messenger of Allah and the beauty of those people, why they are called the Ansar. The manifestation of what Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, Kuru Ansar Lillah. They become the Ansar who are going to be immortalized inside of what human history is because that's what they, they were true to that covenant. They were true to that pact with the Prophet ﷺ. They lost their lives over the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And that's going to bring um, the onset of the Hijrah. Once that now, the Deen is secured. And now the Ansar are going to embrace the Prophet ﷺ as the head of state. That's what they're going to embrace. That's, that's definitely the, the import of the actual contract they take with him. The Prophet ﷺ is going to command the Hijrah on behalf of the, Allah Ta'ala will command the Hijrah, the actual flight to which the Prophet ﷺ is going to face and foremost command the companions all to leave one by one. Only two are given the express command not to leave. That's Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. They've got, they've got to wait for specific permission and everybody else is commanded to leave, even Umar ibn al-Khattab. The majority of the believers are going to leave with Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab ta'ala, and over 20 of the believers are going to leave, which remember that's a lot, that's basically all the believing community. A lot of them, over 70 of them are still in Abyssinia, okay? There's still very few believers inside of Mecca. And over 20 of them believe with Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab because protection was there. And Sayyidina Umar, in order to make sure you understood with protection, the Prophet said, leave without anybody knowing, okay? And Sayyidina Umar goes then to why he goes to the Kaaba and he tells all the Quraysh, Umar ibn al-Khattab is leaving for what? Yathrib, I'm leaving for Yathrib. So anybody who wants to make their wives, widows, and their children orphans, just in the canyon behind the mountain there, we'll, we'll have it off. And the Sayyidina Umar goes, and he just waits, and nobody follows him. So he gets the point, let him go. And then to the believers then leave with Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab to Medina to Manawara. So that's the first sort of party to arrive. Before, before he arrives, Sayyidina Mus'ab arrives, which is amazing. Now what Mus'ab must have understood from this is the greatness of the Hijrah. Because he goes to Medina to teach, not for Hijrah. Musab then retains all the way back to Mecca, then retains back to Medina, just for Hijrah, Sayyidina Musab ibn Umar. So he's a muhajir for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Umar goes with those followers, then all that's going to be left is the Prophet sallallahu and others. Sayyidina Suhaib al-Rumi is another beautiful Sayyidina Suhaib al-Rumi, who's old. Sayyidina Suhaib ibn Siham al-Rumi, that he's very old, but he's a master archman. He used to be a slave you know, from Europe, some say he was actually Persian. And he's from Asfahan, some, there's some opinions he's from Asfahan. And the say the Suhaib was a slave and then bought himself out of slavery. And then he became very wealthy, he became a trader inside of what Mecca. And he became very wealthy. But look at the, the, the meaning of Hijrah to the, to the Sahaba. That he then goes to the Kaaba and he says to the, he says to the Quraysh that I've made wealth from you. I mean, he could have mentioned the fact that you, I mean, you, yeah, and he subjugated me and rendered me property in Mecca. 
Please, I've made a lot of wealth from you. And he said, all my wealth is there. And he said, all of my wealth is yours. It was made in this society, it's all yours. But I'm about to leave for Yathrib. And he says, by Allah, anyone who prevents me from leaving for Yathrib, and he's got his bow and arrow, he says, my arrow will reach their liver before they reach me, believe me. And he, he said he was a master archman, saying a sahib or a marubi. But look, look at the price. He's there in front of the melon, the great leaders of Quraysh, and, and he's threatening violence. If you want, take my money, it's all yours. But if you want to try and prevent me, I'm going to kill on the basis of this. And he hasn't been given permission to kill or to threaten with life. Uh, and then Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harab, Abu Sufyan, the great Abu Sufyan, says, look, the man is being very fair, isn't he? That's a very fair offer. I mean, in a sense, what do we need with it? A low life, like Suhaib al Rumi, we don't need, let him go. We've got his money, and then what? Saying the Suhaib ta'ala leaves Mecca penniless, penniless, as many of the Sahaba are going to do, which becomes a causative reason why war is going to be sanctioned to take the wealth that what was misappropriated inside of Mecca. The verses in the Quran substantiate that, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, yeah, we're going to look at the what the Hijrah within the period of the Hijrah, we've entered into the blessed days of Muharram, which is the last part of the, the three. Um, periods of sanctity, Allah Ta'ala has given us four periods of sanctity, four Ashur al Huram, three of them in Al Bukhari, four Mutatabi'ah, they fall in succession, and Idul Qa'da, Idul Hijjah, now we've entered into Muharram. It's like 90 days of real sort of great gifts bestowed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala upon His Ummah, the Ummah of the Prophet, so we should expose ourselves to it. But this is this period of time where the Hijrah begins. Like what we're speaking about is happening at this period of time. And no doubt it's the most important event as understood by the Sahaba. That's why Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab is going to measure time from it. Okay, time is going to be measured from the Hijrah in and of itself. I, okay, and so this is the period of time we're in, shall we, in our next session. We'll also discuss you know, the Hijrah in and of itself and what the arrival of the Prophet وسلم, means inside of Medina. So for all intended purposes, Yani Mecca is inshallah, as we brought to a conclusion, inshallah. Anyone have any questions?